Steve August Falcher, hello and welcome to the Iron Mountain Literature Festival 2021 and welcome to our guests this evening Owen McNamee, Rita Ann Higgins and Kerry Nidharthi who begins with a reading from her book Thin Places. The Bridge of Sorrows Even as a child I could see no way of staying in my hometown the edges of the broken and breaking city never quite held themselves in place and my own family life mirrored these fractures. There was just so much loss all around me. Everywhere I turned seemed stabbed right through, constantly punctured by the outside world. The past, present and future all seemed to blend into one and every single part of the story held sorrow that I couldn't get rid of, no matter how deep I tried to bury it. So many different things, situations, times of the year, people, made the bad things rise up from inside to bite me again. Triggers, I know that now. It left me feeling scared, hollowed out and with no control over any of it not really knowing how to make it, any of it, stop. I grew up to start with in a terraced house on a rough grey council estate. Rather, I started my growing up in the garden of that house, spending as much time knee deep in the mud that never really dried out due to the unstoppable rain that swept in from the Atlantic. Ours is a past steeped in rust. A history bathed in thick black squelch, mudlarking always for our sense of self. If I had to describe that first house I would struggle. I remember a yellow teapot on the top shelf of a chipped red dresser in the kitchen which looked out into the garden. If, on the other hand, you asked me to describe that small space enclosed by tall grey concrete walls filled with the sounds of the next door neighbours fighting through windows that wouldn't close properly, I could outline that garden for you in perfect and minute detail. I spent most of my early childhood, no matter the season, in that man-made jungle of a garden. I was outside every chance I got. I was outside because it simply made no sense to me to be indoors. My parents would find me utterly transfixed and bogging dirty, hands holding all sorts of treasure. I'd beg them to close their eyes and open their grown up hands so I could fill them with the wonder of the living, breathing, dying world. Broken bricks in the corner of the backyard filled up with ladybirds in descending size order, each limb and wing compared and contrasted against its brother or sister. Frogs would come to our garden from the stream at the bottom of our housing estate to die, and I buried each one with a handwritten poem. I grieved for them so deeply, so fully, I remember feeling their loss like a wounded knee. During those early days in our housing estate's concrete, impoverished world, I learned so much about just getting through. I didn't realise this for many decades though, and it took me many more years of growth to understand that sometimes, out of concrete cracks, hardy, bright poppies appear in places where no seed has been planted. Back then, the city of Derry had seen 20 years of civil war in its public spaces, our sacred and safe places, which had resulted in a deep-rooted fear, the ripples of which could be felt in more than just the devastating human loss that was visible. When whole streets are burned down and the face of a city changed beyond recognition, very few folk notice their disconnect with the natural world. When you've no home to go to because it's been petrol bombed, seeking the wonder of the wild world is not a priority. 
Derry was a dark city to be in for my childhood and I was scared. That first housing estate was completely Protestant. As a child, I knew the disgusting words being thrown around my street as loosely as lemonade bottle petrol bombs were about Catholics just like my mum. I knew everything could go up in smoke at any moment as you were walking to buy credit to feed the poverty bells, the squealing electricity meter. The worst things got in our council estate, children being suffocated with flags for being from the wrong street, punishment beatings, cats being burned within inches of their lives as a warning to their unwelcome owners, the more I retreated into myself. I stopped talking and would sit at the bottom of our garden alone, facing the grey plaster wall for hours. I grew wordless, trapped under the weight of the violence, silently screaming out from under the frozen river. Loss and violence swallowed the verges of things and I watched from the corner as my childhood was eaten up. The shadow that my hometown made of itself and of all those still held within, left no space for anything else. There was too much darkness to even try to grow. The troubles have left scars that run too deep to see. I left at the earliest point I could, but none of those new places gave me the feeling of home I was so desperately searching for. I wore loss and sorrow on the surface of my weathered young skin. I ran from place to place, rootless, lonely, and never quite knowing how to ask anyone to help me back up from underneath the hard black ice. Time, as we know, like the sea, is a force and creature all of its own. We can stop neither of them. We stand on the sand, watching as the days become years, as the line made by the tide disappears, as the hungry waves devour the borderline that once defined the land. People, places, experiences, and the act of living a life. Our days come together and we find we have grown. We are being carried in time's salty course. I found myself a third of the way through the year that was 2016, at the age of 31, returning to my hometown of Derry, doing the one thing I'd promised myself I would never, ever do. Kerry thank you so much and, and welcome to uh, the Iron Mountain Literature Festival. Was the Derry that you returned to in, in 2016 very different to the one in which you grew up and in which you describe so vividly there? It's one that I still ponder, actually, to this day, in particular when I read from the book. Um, because we know that memory is a very interesting thing and even in looking back on 2016 now, I wonder if I've even fully got the whole story. But of course it was a different Derry because Derry is this ever-shifting place sort of a bit like a shapeshifter its own self and yes I found it an incredibly changed place but so much had not changed and I suppose that's what I tried to explore a little bit in the book. And I suppose 2016 was a very particular year to be coming back as well, you know, the anniversary, the centenary of the 1916 rising in obviously very important in in that city um, but going back you know there are so many things we could talk about in relation to the book but uh, Apart from, I suppose, the, the general undertow of violence and division in the North at the time you're growing up, is your own family I got an extra whack of, of, of direct and hard prejudice from both sides? Because your parents were in what was called a, a mixed marriage. Your, your dad was Protestant, your mum was Catholic. How did that antagonism and prejudice manifest itself? So, yeah, it was a very particular year to move back, you're correct. And I actually moved back um, on the Easter weekend. So I, I moved back on the centenary and I moved firstly to the bog side. So I kind of had this funny, almost folkloric journey into being back there. And it sort of unraveled its own self as, as stories do and as lives do. 
And yeah, to answer the second part of your question, my as as you know because you've read the book, my my parents are from a mixed background, which um, sort of was fine for a while, but then you know in this sort of early part of my life. Um, led to quite a lot of difficulty. We were petrol bombed out of one home. We moved to the other side of the river. The, for those who don't know, the river foil kind of had used to very, not neatly, but almost divided the city. Um, and we moved to the other side of the river where we didn't quite fit in either. And I suppose that sense of not really fitting in, of not really being safe or welcome, um, is something that has haunted my life for a long time and is probably why I wrote the book in a way. So in a way you're an outsider on both sides, yeah. both sides of the river. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and maybe not a bad thing uh, for, for a writer, you know, for a, a putative writer. I mean, a striking detail in, in the passage you read is the pervasive nature of poverty. Um, mm -hmm the sound of the poverty bells of the electricity meters is such an evocative phrase. Um, that poverty was pretty much everywhere, wasn't it? And really defining of, of the city. Completely. And I suppose in many ways it still is. It's a different kind of poverty that's there, but there is still an exceptional amount of loss that's constantly being sort of um, thrown at the city really and Brexit has actually, as I explore a bit in the book, Brexit has actually created this incredible sense of um, of loss really and poverty of not just not just money or food or but you know the loss and the lack that's there is sort of cultural and and, and the people that have had to leave because they've lost their job or there just isn't space for them to really grow and develop. And I'm kind of drawn to that. How can we sort of write a new story for Derry? Because it's so deserving of, of everything, of everything that's good. And, you, you, and of course you are, you are helping to write that story. And from the beginning, you know, in the midst of that war of the Troubles, mm. a child finds consolation in nature. The image of you as, as a little girl, out in the rain and the mud, in the garden, offering up treasures to your parents. That's very moving, you know, and you writing a poem to place the ground with the frogs you buried. You know. So the foundation of the adult you is very strong from very early on. Yeah, and I wonder if it is for all of us as well. You know, I wonder what, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I've just become a mum, and I wonder how our surroundings from very early feed into who we become. Because we, I, I look at this in the book a little, that we can't, we can't be defined by where we've come from, but at the same time we can't run away from it. And those things that are around us, you know, why are some of us drawn to particular things? You know, and how do we carry that with us in our life? And recently, um, I was, I, I'm always asked, do I view myself, say, as a nature writer? And I suppose that's a funny question because it, it, I write about lived experience. And for me, the natural world is not separate from me. I'm not separate from it. I'm, I'm just as much a part of it as you know, the fox that we saw on the way here or, you know, the butterfly wing I found just before I came in. And I suppose there's that sense of, in the book, I didn't really know how to write about my experiences without bringing in. Well, it's clear that that was me. there from the beginning for you, you know, yeah. that that passion in a way for the natural world is obviously yeah. a, a very much a part of you and yeah. seems to have helped you as writing those early poems. I mean, that seems to have been yeah. the young you exploring yeah. the world and yeah. what you would later make manifest in the, in the book. Yeah, and I suppose I'm just exceptionally grateful, you know, for where I grew up and, you know, for the fact that even in really kind of quite scary moments of mm. my life that, you know, there, it just, the natural world just keeps on living and dying and making and breaking and and there's something in that cyclical world that reminds me that there's always another chance, there's always hope. After you did your, your 
A-levels. You moved from Derry to Dublin to go to Trinity College to do a degree. And you, I was very struck by your descriptions of those years and that experience. You know, you had to take on several jobs to help pay your way. Mm. You moved accommodation regularly yeah. because rents were so expensive. Mm. Not much changes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you've, I think, maybe felt outside the system quite a, quite a bit, though fortunately you made it through. Mm. Did you also feel somewhat of an outsider because you came from the north? Um, you know, was was that division or perception of division maybe palpable to you? It's something I've always been interested in. This, the, the notion of do we do we here in the Republic do we treat people from Northern Ireland slightly differently? Is there an edge of in that relationship? I suppose interestingly, because my view is that I grew up on an island. Um, I, I might have been oblivious to that because I think I didn't view there as being any issue with me being there. I don't think that was part of my, my mindset. And I, you know, like, yeah, I remember being slagged off. You know, I worked, I worked in a, a pub on Harcourt Street and I remember, you know, my, my accent being slagged repeatedly. But then I've been in parts of the North where my accent was slagged as equally, yeah. if not more. So I suppose um, it's all to do with mindset, one's own mindset. And I, yeah, I think I, yeah, I, I felt that I had a right to be there. And I don't think I carried any sense of that when I was there. Good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> can we talk about a concept which you, you reference in, in Thin Places and which yeah. Patrick Keelty touched on strongly in, in his recent mm. TV documentary on life in Northern mm. Ireland? Intergenerational or transgenerational trauma, this passing on down generations of pain, of suffering, mm. emotional and psychological damage. I suppose it's an unavoidable reality for thousands of people in, in Northern Ireland mm. and I, I think you would say it probably has been a non-avoidable reality for you. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a good point that many of us have experienced in our lived experience, um, the passing on of something that wasn't quite ours to carry. So that sense of, um, you know, you're, sometimes we, we feel it, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but we feel a, a, a really deep rooted sense of sorrow or of misunderstanding or of confusion or haziness or fogginess at points in our life. And, we, and it seems like everything else, and I speak about this in the book, everything else looks like it's so great. We've got a great job. We've got fantastic friends. We are in a brilliant place, but there's something we can't shake off. And I suppose I'd experienced that, and I've spoken with a plethora of other people from the North who, of, d of varying ages and uh, with varying backgrounds who've experienced the same thing. And I suppose that we don't realise how deeply trauma lingers and how it has roots that kind of spread out, a little bit like the way trees speak to one another in a forest underneath. And I suppose, I hadn't really fully realised until I wrote the book how trauma rips through, you know, like wildfire. And I guess in researching the book and in looking at the various things that we, we experience differently than what maybe someone my age in another part of, say, the UK might experience or someone elsewhere and we really begin to understand it when we properly think back. So the troubles really for me reaches much further back. You know, I, I, I think of the famine and I talk in the book of what has torn families apart. You know, people have literally been leaving our land for hundreds of years and that leaves a trace a deep trace and I suppose I saw is it called a meme you know one of these quirky little things where there are lots of matches that were lit and they were all standing beside one another and the one match is removed from this line mm. and of course you know what happens then and I can't get that image out of my head. <laughs> yes. That sense of it only takes one person to step out of that, whether it be the victim mentality or whether it be the pain and the hurt that ripples through and keeps carrying on. And I suppose that 
any any art that we are we're privileged enough to to partake in offers us the opportunity to step outside and I, I'm really grateful to have been able to write this book because I feel that in doing so I've stood on the shoulders of all of the people that came before me who, who tried to stand outside. And in, in a way other people give one courage, you know, you're very open about about your own suffering and the emotional extremes to which you were driven at times. And I suspect that's part of a generational change, you know, that younger people are more willing to talk candidly about their depression or addiction or despair linked to war, to trauma, and maybe that offers hope, that kind of openness. I, I feel that hope is, it's a, hope is a language and hope is an active thing and it, it is a verb. And I think that that verb can take many, many forms. Hope can be talking, it can be shouting, it can be sleeping, resting, loving, moving, growing, burning. And I suppose that, as you said, if any of us can talk at all about what we've gone through or about what others have gone through that we feel we're in some way related to, that's got to be a good thing. It might not always be easy because this wasn't an easy book to write and it hasn't been an easy book to talk about. And But I felt very firmly that it, that I, I, it was like a wild creature inside me. It had to come out. Well, it, that kind of speech is like the antidote to, you know, that perception of the Northern saying nothing, you know, that, that, that at the heart of, of, of Northern culture. You know, yeah. This is say something, yeah. say it clearly and say it with courage, don't be afraid to totally. speak out. And you also say, and I'm again very taken by this, that you believe there are enough people, and especially young people now, who are determined to protect the peace that has been hard won. I, you feel confident about I that. feel very confident about that, I do. And I, I feel like we're, we are changing. We are, we are changing as a nation in general. The island is changing. And the North has been this continuous space of regeneration and regrowth and of change. And I suppose it's intriguing for me. I wonder how we'll, at all parts of the island, because the more that we talk about something, the more the onus is on actually listening. You know, we can talk as much as we like, and it's a bit like the, you know, the situation in the South where incredible women like Elaine Feeney and Marine Huron, so many women have been speaking out about what women and children have gone through in the South. And in the North, we're in a similar level. You know, we can talk till we're blue in the face, but the listening is almost the more important. Coming back to, I suppose, the force of nature and the natural world, as a way of healing, as a source of consolation, you know, these constant themes and threads in the book, you know, birds, the sea, butterflies, moths, wild places here in Ireland, in Scotland, Wales, England, bringing you insight, I suppose, comfort, the will and light at times to go on. And it's interesting, again, that you have somebody like Dara McInulty as a strong young writer, taking nature maybe as a way as well of rising above and really confronting the big survival issue that we all must confront this time, which is climate change and, and the changing face of, of nature in, because of what we do. Um, you, again, are very passionate about the need for young people, for, well, for all of us, mm. to engage with the realities of climate change. Yeah, I mean, Dara McAnulty is a fantastic person and a really, I'm just so proud to be from the same island as him. And I suppose that climate emergency is, it's, it is the biggest question that any of us can ask. And it, it almost, I've just, I've reread actually, I'm not sure if you've read Rebecca Tomosh's book, Strangers, a collection of essays that explores just so much, but it's one of the best creative nonfiction books I've ever read. And she mentions in it that she was reading a piece of fiction, a contemporary piece of fiction, and it didn't mention climate emergency. And she said, how can we be at a stage where anything doesn't touch on it. And I suppose I can't get that idea out of my head that somehow everything we do 
impacts on the world that we, the, those that we share the world with, the non-human. But it's how to engage in a way that doesn't make people put their head in the ground because we, we, we must continue to try. And I suppose that balance is, it's a delicate dance, but it's probably the most important dance that any of us will ever do together. How do we take people with us? An, an interesting phrase you use um, that I hadn't come across before, um, ecological grief. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I understand it, but talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so again, it's something that many of the writers that I value and I'm very grateful for will explore in their work. It's just this sense of a bit like intergenerational trauma in that there's something in us that might rear its head on occasion where we, we don't understand why we're feeling down, we don't understand why we're feeling helpless or worthless. And then we remember, well look at what is happening in the world that I am part of. I'm just as much a part of this world as, you know, the whales that are washing up or the birds that are being found with their stomachs full of absolute, you know, horrendous things, you know, or the people who are carrying the most sort of um, trauma because of climate emergency. You know, it's often that sense of the human has been at the top for so long in our, in our outlook. And then finally, we're beginning to now realise that actually, in order to continue coexisting, we need to change that. And ecological grief is that sense of what we lose, we lose. You know, when they go, they go forever and they're part of our being. And how can we continue in a world where we don't know what's going to be left? And I suppose, you know, lots of, it seems to be I'm drawn to strong female writers, but a lot of women are exploring this and their mothers often, you know. So Lucy Jones, you know, who writes in Losing Eden about just that sense of what, how can I speak to my children knowing what I've done, what I'm part of and yeah. Grief is a, it's a, an iridescent bird and we have to Yes, it it is, is a thing with feathers, isn't it, very often? Yeah. Um, I was uh, very taken by something you, you say in the book, which was that, uh, you know, growing up, going to school, there was a, a greater chance of you learning Icelandic mm -hmm. than there was of you, of you learning Irish. Uh, talk to me about that and a little bit about then your, your exploration of the Irish language as a source of knowledge, I suppose, and, and insight into the, the life and culture of, of this country. Yeah, so I went to, to a school that would never have, it just would never have happened, you know, I just could never have learned there. And I suppose I didn't really realise until I was much older that that was a form of loss or grief as well. So that sense of coming from a place where I literally couldn't speak the language and I still can't, you know, I'm, I'm still sort of trying bit by bit to grapple my way towards some Engaged form, with it. yeah, some form of understanding and I feel like the journey is the important thing and I suppose that my, my own sense of self feels stronger even in just having accepted that I have a desire to learn. Because I think that, you know, I spoke with Owen McNamee about this recently, just that sense of even one word that one can internalise. It, I mean, I, I have this experience where I've learned a word in Irish and I've dreamed about it afterwards. And I suppose that's how deep it goes. Because I feel pretty firmly that we're, we're tied together by things like language and by reclaiming language and place, we can reclaim something that perhaps we feel we'd lost. I have to ask you about, uh, about Dairy Girls. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this, this, this great series, which has in a way, I think, mm. shifted the way all of us perceive mm. not only 
the city of Derry and its people, but aspects of, of yeah. those awful, awful years of, of violence and the troubles. And I, and I wonder again, is that part of this new generation and that hope that we, that we can use mm -hmm. laughter and humour as a way of reconsidering the past almost and, and maybe redeeming a great deal from it? That's a big question. I mean, I love Derry Girls. <laughs> just love it. Anytime anybody ever speaks about Dairy Girls and in the same breath as Thin Places, I do this little kind of fangirl dance. Um, because there's nothing else like it. There's nothing else like being able to take an experience like that and, and make it sing. And I suppose I'm I'm really grateful that it exists in the world and I'm really grateful that when I go places people have seen it and I suppose um, I don't think there's anything else I can say except I love it. I it was love Lisa. Yeah, <laughs> it was really funny to see uh, John Whittingdale, the Tory minister recently, yes. saying that Derry Girls was a great example of yeah. Yeah. British TV, you know, the British theme television. You think they don't ever get it, do they? But I think he was just trying to be funny in a dairy yeah. way. I Maybe. mean, I'm assuming, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that's, no? a, that's a very good way. That's, a, that's <laughs> one way of looking at it. Um, you have a piece um, coming out in a, in a, in a book, um, The New Frontier, being published by, by New Island later this month. Um, a book, a series of essays on loosely on the border and and yeah. and such such matters tell me a little bit about about your own piece and about the book yeah so the book is is being edited by an incredible individual james patterson who's actually just signed his own collection of stories as well i think it's with picador so watch out for it um but it's the the new frontier that's coming out with new island it's available on pre-order from this month actually it's going to be very intriguing because the, the group of people that James has commissioned is really cracking. We've got, you know, there's poets there, like new poets, um, really established poets. So people like Jess McKinney, Amreen Huron, alongside people like Darren Anderson, the, you know, the author of the astonishingly good inventory. So I suppose um, what will be great about that is that there'll be all of these voices kind of singing out. I imagine in quite dis accordant harmony um, and I'm really privileged to have been asked to kind of to, to write for it. My piece is quite odd. <laughs> I wrote it um, in pregnancy and I when I reread it I kind of went oh <laughs> that's where my brain was then but um, I think a lot of my writing has become since then places has become quite odd and I think that's okay but um, I expect Explore the idea of what we carry, those of us that grew up on the border, what we carry and how it, how it comes up in different moments um, and how we can, the border can be so many things and yeah I'm really excited about, about that collection. Kerry, you, you, you've mentioned that you've, you've become a, a, a mum for the first time mm. this year. Uh, and congratulations, and I'm sure it's a, a wonderful thing. Uh, I wonder, you know, what what kind of what kind of world uh, would you like your little son mm. to inherit? What kind of place would you hope we can manage to make on on this island a place in which he can he can dwell happily and at peace? That's a beautiful question. Um, my hope would be that on this island we really begin, like I mentioned earlier, to listen. Because for so long people have been crying out and we have either silenced them or we've just not listened. And we've not given everyone the chance to be at the table. And I suppose I would want my son to grow up on an island where everyone was respected and everyone was at the table and that won't look easy but it must happen and I suppose on a wider scale at the beginning you said what kind of world would I like him to grow up in and I suppose that for me there's no difference between Ireland and anywhere else I, I, I really want us to take our rightful place which means allowing everything that we share this earth with to be respected.
and honoured and I suppose I'm confident that we're moving in the right direction and people laugh at my hope. I know that, <laughs> but I think that's okay. Oh, optimism is always a very good thing. Um, I'm not sure if it's optimism though. I wonder if optimism is a, is a slightly, mm. a slightly different thing from hope. I think hope is its own kind yes, of, right. hope is its own creature. I'm not sure if I would call myself optimistic actually. I carry a lot of worry and anxiety and pessimism, but they somehow, they, they don't trump hope in a way. Yes. Well, there is, I think there is a kind of practical optimism where, where one yeah. doesn't just hope, you know, it's, it's about yeah. trying to make sure that you do with some things that, yes. that make that change happen to Absolutely. that it's it's not it's not passive you know I think yeah. it's whatever we do and I need to I think you're right and I I for me to feel hope I need to be doing and you are and <laughs> 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 um, Kerry could we could we finish with another reading from Thin Places um, you were very close to your your grandfather your, your father's father and there's there's a lovely memory of him that seems mm. actually to speak to the future um, yeah. out of the past. Absolutely you, and before I know. read it I just want to say that um, my grandfather was born as I explore in the book in the same week as the Irish border and my um, my son was born in the same week as as both the border and my grandfather would have turned a hundred and I suppose there's hope in that isn't there so yeah thank you for having me We have a somewhat difficult relationship with the word tradition in Ireland, particularly in the North. The way that religion has latched itself onto the politics of this land has left many people with no desire to look at the imagery of their ancestors, the story of their past. We have lost, broken, murdered, burned, stolen, hidden and undone all in the false name of tradition. Lives, places and stories have been ripped out by their roots because that's how it has always been. I wonder, I wonder so very much these days what wealth of imagery and meaning was lost when we became so focused on our differences here that we buried the things that had once tied us together the things that might still know a way through for us all. Once, 20 years ago, when I was not quite 16, my grandfather and I had a conversation that has stayed with me for almost two decades. My grandfather called on people, and I see now how lucky I was to be taken along with him on his trips in and out of various homes and workplaces greeted many times a day by so many different people from various backgrounds that I lost count. He was drawn to people who looked after those who needed to be cared for. He counted amongst his friends people who rehomed pigeons and canaries and an old woman whose two up two down house had so many dog baskets that she had to keep her kitchen table folded up beside her ironing board and hope meal times would be dry enough that she could eat on the street outside her front door. My grandfather had friends who worked every hour sent to them volunteering for the Salvation Army, the Church's Trust, St Vincent de Paul, the Men's Mission and more. I never understood until very recently why my grandfather was never happy to be in the house he so dearly loved, in the comfort of his own sitting room. Why, after decades working himself to the bone, did he not just want to slow down and begin to enjoy his time at home, to relax in his own place with his own family? I know what drove my grandfather towards showing the care towards others that he did now. I think that growing up without a parent, perhaps particularly your mother, as a constant, reliable source of support, protection and love, does something to a person 
over which they have no real control. It changes you so drastically, so fundamentally that you have to make a choice. What am I to do with all of this hurt? My grandfather chose to find his own way through it, to stop it from taking root and turning into bitterness and anger. My grandfather found the courage to step out of the cycle. My grandfather took his suffering and he turned it into empathy, into compassion. He gave those around him that which he had never been given. Oterardery. These are people who are coming over here from Africa to sponge off the system here in Ireland. TD Noel Grealish at a public meeting in Oterard on the 11th of September 2019 to fight plans to provide a direct provision centre there. Yes, it's a noun around town. It stands for keep them down, way, way down. Vows were taken and given. We vowed to keep them out. We vowed and we vowed. We, the ad hoc committee. There was no tenderness in the tender process. We want to be informed of every move that every mouse and man makes in this town. This is our town. We are proud to be proud. And we say it out loud, proud to be proud, wearing our ad hoc jocks. You are not the persecuted Christians we were half expecting. Ye are not the economic refugees coming over from Africa. Ye lied barefaced. We want the persecuted Christians. Ye have mobile phones and ye look healthy. We are ad hocery. We are a hoonery. We are buffoonery, we are baboonery, we are blackguardery, but most of all, we are Ucterardery, and Ucterard says no. <laughs> Uh, Rita Ann Higgins uh, reading your reading your poem Uthrardry from her new collection Pathogens Love at Patsy Pandemic and other poems. Uh, Rita, uh, that's a poem pre-pandemic, but I suppose a different kind of pandemic uh, from two years ago. Um, and uh, you don't pull any punches in it in confronting. I suppose a, a particular community's opposition to plan uh, to plan to house refugees in a local hotel. Um, what spurred your poetic anger and that response to the events in Uthrard in, in 2019. It was reminiscent of uh, an event that happened some years before in my own estate where uh, at an open, um, a, a travellers were moving into our area and there was an open meeting and people were chanting actually get them out uh, we don't want them and you know it was, it was quite frightening but um, I referred to Rahunery there and we lived in the flats in Rahun for a while but this uh, the the term was coined before we lived there we we were there in 1977 this this happened in about 1970 travelers moved into Rahun and local people went at them with sticks and uh, handles of brushes and shovels and that's how the term Rahunery came to be and I kind of, in my my mind, I linked it all together because I couldn't but link it all together because it seemed to me, this is the same thing again. You know, this is keep them out. This is, we are intolerant. We don't want them. But we're going to say other things so that people will think we're on the right side. And so we'll say, you're not this, but you're that. All blather and... Uh, absolutely no question about it but uh, there was a right-wing element involved in the Uchter artery because people were coming in that weren't from the village weren't from the town and we found this out afterwards and they were saying you know it's ridiculous you can't be letting these people these there are always these people you can't be letting these people in and it kind of it it, it worked for me as a poem and I got the old bit of rage out. Yes. <laughs> and I went home happy, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. went to and bed happy. There's also a, a great kind of rhythm and sound to Oop the Rodgery. You know, yes. You know, a great conjunction with Rahunery. And do you, did you ever get any kind of 
kickback for a public stance like that. You know, you, oh God, you don't yeah. seem to have any fear of taking on an issue like that uh, yeah. or, or many others. Oh, yeah. I mean, people people either like me or hate me. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone <laughs> likes me, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, after the after the, the, the Galway 2020, you know, I was shouted at on the street, really? you know, but I just kept going and I'm not on social media, so I'm cowardly in that sense. So that you know, there well, are courageous self protective Yeah, people, yeah. But right. but you but people will, will, will find you and, mm. and say things and uh, for me to respond on the street wouldn't have I ni few way. It mm. wouldn't have been I it yeah. wouldn't have been worth it for me. I couldn't do that. Mm. So I just let him have his so that, that shouting on the street in response to your poem, Killer City, yeah. uh, which is, I think, a terrific poem, you know, no, no. again, no holds barred about Galway City and what is sometimes a, in a, a facade of great culture. And then you look behind it and, you see and the reality can be very different. That's it, the Legionnaire's disease in the, in the, the, the fire station, because I have my my nephew was a fireman and he, he told me about this. He's no longer with us, but uh, I heard this from him and I know um, about art as product in Galway. I've always known this. It's it's product. You're almost invisible. And so the artists saw all, all of a sudden we're having a capital of culture. But really, the artists were secondary. It was the product first, we, you know, and, and it was all staged, managed, kind of. And well, I remember at the time, uh, the kind of devilish part of me wanting to produce a T-shirt that would say, uh, culture of capital. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> I should, maybe I should have. Maybe. There's, sti there's still time. Um, when did you start to write, Rita? And, and, and what spurred that, that initial expression? Um, I had TV in 1977 and I was in Merlin Park and um, I, uh, Anne and Mark Kennedy, uh, people would know them, Anne Kennedy was a great friend of mine and godmother to, to my second child and she, they brought me up Animal Farm and I read, I read that and I was reading Wuthering Heights. So th they were the two books like, sure, I couldn't go wrong, <laughs> 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 yeah. you know? And I just got, I got it. I kind of got that parable of the, the animals, uh, re the revolt. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, that, that's, how, that's how it was really. And then I went into a workshop and I, I had this poem about the sanatorium. It was called The Wasting. It was called Wasting. Mm -hmm. And I, I read that poem at Jesse Lindini's workshop and uh, it, was, it wasn't good, but she was so encouraging and Mike Allen was there, her husband at the time. And, uh, but I actually, I did actually start with prose and I, I thought, you know, I'll write this short story, but somebody was saying, uh, and the short story was about TB as well, it was about the TB ward. Uh, the, the, somebody in the group was saying, but you, you're getting your tenses all, you're going to the past, the present, the future. You, <laughs> you can't be doing that, like wake up. And then I thought poetry has got to be easier than this. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can do anything you like with tenses, you know, yes, time, yeah, you time can, moves. Uh, you know, time yeah, moves. Uh, the broad theme of, of this year's Iron Mat Festival is beyond borders and, it, you know, not just physical or political borders, but it's, it's also borders of fear and prejudice and division of all kinds. Uh, and from a, the get-go, I suppose, you've looked at those divisions and, and the very hard border of poverty and deprivation in, in this country. And you'd be very clear about that. Well, we, you know, if you grow up in it, and our biggest uh, issue when the girls were small, very small, was finding that 50, 50 cents or whatever it was for the Irish dancing. And that was our struggle. And I said, Jesus, they have to do the Irish dancing because everyone else in the class does the Irish dancing. <laughs> and, you know, but everyone around us was in the same position as that. So we, we didn't know any better. And, um, and I also came from that, but it wasn't any, there was no, absolutely no shame in it, you know, and it was, you meet the, you meet the, yeah. the, the best people. And we did have the, a wonderful uh, growing up in yes. the country in Ballybridge and, uh, but I did kind of, I did kind of notice there's a couple of differences 
oh, some people get treated better than other people and it's a lot about money and it's a lot about power and uh, so there, there's always borders but you know it isn't doesn't have to be the political border as you say yourself and um, you've, you've two short terrific poems uh, that I suppose that that address something of that, those, those the, the sometimes invisible borders, you know, the, the, uh, uh, that I'd, I'd love you to, to read um, for us, Prism uh, and Borders. And they, they're, yeah, they're, they're to review this great kind of Gunther way of, of getting things sometimes. And they're, they're kind of related in a way because they're, they're like sister poems mm. or brother poems. Prism, after the man up our street stuck broken glass on top of his back wall to keep out those youngsters who never stopped teasing his Doberman pincher. He put the safety chain on the door, sat at the kitchen window, let out a nervous laugh and watched the Castle Park sun divide the light and scatter it all over his property. And the other one then was uh, a different type of border, but nevertheless, um, a border all the same and it's I'll just read it first mm. there's no hope of a joyrider here no one wears broken glass on their back walls here there are no back walls no front walls no fences with menaces no rottweilers no child eating dobermans no pinch of tension in the air that sets fire to a good night's sleep no jumping that no jumpiness that incites the joints to early arthritis. This is Pheasantville, easy peasy, boring and bog. Warbler Boulevard, meander lane, the pace, meander lane, the pace the same. The borders here are invisible. You'll find them rarely in the bend of a look, the vexed angle of a grin, the crew cut greeting, the verb that takes longer to pall. Terrific. And yeah. that one would relate to Connemara, yes. and you know, so I'd be in the estate and later uh, I rented a place in, in Connemara and I just absolutely loved it. I can no longer do it. There was a time yeah. there where you could rent anywhere in yeah. the country. And no longer. <laughs> no longer. Not yeah. nowadays. No, more of, of the changing social realities of Ireland. But uh, Connemara brings us to something else I wanted to talk to you about, which is, you know, your, your, your grow for the Irish language, you know, that, that connection. You know, you, your poet writes in English, but you have this love for Irish and you have a, you know, a deep, connection to further west and to, to Connemara. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, my mother was from Mary and my father was from Litchermore, South Connemara. And uh, he, he had a few issues with the language, you know, he, and Chonga <laughs> And uh, he used to say, what are you interested in that bloody language, that bloody poverty language for? But at the same time, um, he always, he lilted. And he, always, he was always singing a waka to my hay machine and Peggy let your roar. So he never moved from the song, mm -hmm. but he never moved from the language either. But he knew the hardship of it because when I went out, when I, we used to go out there, several of us would go out in the car with him sometimes. And sometimes I was with them on my own and they would uh, to meet his relations and they'd uh, he would openly cry when they'd talk about immigration and talk about somebody not coming back. And I was young and I didn't fully understand it, but I knew it was heartbreaking. And I knew that they were always looking out like as if to say they're over there, you know, and, and Litchmore is a remote, remote place. And they, so they were looking out and they were they were talking about immigration and they were uh, they were laughing. But he often openly cried, which mm. I thought, mm. you know, I didn't, I didn't think much of it then. But I think back on it, like it's kind of interesting that that a grown man would do, would do that and then do it in front of relations as well. So this is called <clears throat> Anchanga Ella. Vime i lecher mor la mahar, vime og an og, vi gælder de mahar e glauci janga Ella, vi si de gare i janga Ella, vi si de goli janga Ella, vi si de tafan i janga Ella, vi si de argoint janga Ella. Is nu rahane kan imrika kanche fi imrika, 
Vishi the Queenu Ijonga Ella. So it's lovely. I mean, that it's that's again a reaching back into the language, and uh, you know, you also wrote very movingly uh, in, in an essay about that your father's relationship to Connemara and the language and your relationship to him and to Connemara in the, in the faraways. It's, the it's, faraways, yeah, that's, that really those were, those, the faraways were those people that had immigrated and that me as a child watching their conversation, that was the only way I could describe it later, to call them that who had emigrated were the faraways. And uh, I remember going out there with my father and he was showing me his mother's grave and he couldn't find it and it really upset him. and. Uh, you know, that was all, that was more of it, I thought. Mm. My goodness, how people have suffered. Yeah. We don't know the half of it. Maybe no language could express it. Um, there's a marvellous uh, long poem, Rita, at the heart of, of this latest collection, Pathogen's Love of Patsy, and um, Pandemic to Other Poems. And it's about, a di again, a different kind of pandemic, the, the stigma long attached to mental illness, in this country, the fact that so many people being locked away for most of their lives. And it's, it was a particular relevance in this part of the country. I think I've told you before that the psychiatric hospital in Sligo was known as the Leitrim Hotel because so many people from Leitrim ended up there. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I've written about that myself. But your long poem um, is inspired by um, Hannah Greeley and yes. her book, Bird's Nest Soup. I'm going to ask you to read some sections of the poem, but before you do, maybe tell us a little bit about Hannah and that book and what drew you to write this. Okay, so I got the book. It was this. It was published in 19... The memoir was published in 1971, the, the Hodges Figgis one I have that's well tattered now. And I picked it up one day in the in Abigail Street in the sec, second-hand bookshop and I just could not believe. I thought, oh my goodness, this woman is only waiting for a letter. She only needs a letter and she can walk out the door. And she waited for that letter for 20 years and she never got a letter because th there was slight change in terms by the time she had spent 20 years in there. And I just, it was, it was the most devastating thing for me to write. I actually cried through it and uh, I just thought, what are we, we're responsible in a way for what we, our country reflects us too, doesn't what goes on in the country say a lot about the citizens of the country. So I'll read, I won't read it all, it's too long and I'll read uh, some sections from it. I'll start with two. The letter had only to be from a responsible person a person who didn't hear voices or have vivid dreams. A person who didn't rub shite in their hair. Just a regular boring person with a box room going a begging. If you didn't have a home to go to, an address was the thing. Five. Daddy died when I was five. I was told that he was kind and he loved me. He sang lullabies to me. More of it. The lullabies get flung at you. You can't remember, so what can you say? You are giving memories to have. Here are the memories I've chosen for you. Put them in a sandwich and bite down. I have to think of how hard it was for a mother. She told me Noreen's twins had a birthday Sunday. She didn't know what age they were, but she thinks four. Noreen is our lovely neighbour. One night I dreamt Noreen was my mother. I never told mother though, you can only have one mother. We don't pick them, but our mother is our mother. Nine. The girls are on to me about the dance. Skittish and childlike, they never stop. Swapping hair bands and glittery slides, all the while whooping like swans. Goretti gave me her best red shoes. I say to them, woe there, fillies. It's all well and good for ye, getting yourselves up to 98, but I'll hardly be here. I'll be long claimed out by the time the next fox trots out. 13. The Paul that falls over the dance floor when we are shuffling out is like a tattered overcoat 
It hangs, but it doesn't. It falls, but it floats. It has little comfort, but lots of drafts. Then for a splintered second, our loneliness is complete. The dance hall door is open wide. Men to the left, women to the right. 18. My 21st birthday didn't hang about. I nearly missed it waiting to be claimed out. Waiting is for fools and sailors. You'd never see an albatross waiting. They fly in their sleep and how little they wait. Another thing about the albatross, they don't flap. We flap all day. Where does it get us? We should be more like the albatross. 19. This was society's cesspool, society's shite bucket. Creatures were just left here and not claimed. Thousands of them. Calculating relatives often signed people in and just left them there. Poor devils with leaky brains and acres galore. More important of all, it was free. Three cots a day. Three hots a day and a cot. A prison by any other name. Only... When are you? When you are sentenced in a court, you get a release date. I'm always hopeful that me, that's me, Hannah Hopeful. More birthdays came and went. I was embarrassed my, by my birthday. I never told anyone when it was. It meant I was still here. I've always hated that happy birthday song. So juvenile, so fucking empty. That was 1923. The girls kept me going mostly. They kept, they knew about the many ways to be lonely in one day, in one hour, in one minute. They knew the color and smell of loneliness. We would never show the note takers our true selves, our true feelings. The observers saw what they wanted to see. They reported the mundane stuff. She was seen looking closely at that window. She was seen looking closely at the delivery van. They saw nothing that represented the woman in us. They never looked in our eyes. They knew they never saw the lonely in our eyes. They never saw the person or if they did, it frightened them into their silliness. She was seen looking at the torn chicken wire fence. She was seen looking at the hole in the roof in the woodshed. She was seen eating all her porridge. She was seen leaving half her porridge. We were seen, but they were blind. They never saw the human in us. The person they saw had no dignity. They could treat us like prisoners with no hope. On top of that, there was a distance thing. You'd swear we had TB. They'd stick to the side of the wall when you were passing. You were an untouchable, unless they were inflicting pain. Then you were putty in their hands. That was 23. Uh, I'll skip on to 26. If I made any kind of complaint, I was moved deeper and deeper into this ominous old building. You were treated like an idiot. The treatment was often meted out in smirks and nods and gasps, a withholding of a new blouse that was dropped in for you by Noreen, the nice neighbour, a withholding of information that would benefit you, a withholding of common decency, a withholding of any trace of grace or understanding, a withholding of withholding, a ham-fisted attempt at sarcasm. Hannah can't sleep. Well, let's move her into the East Wing, where she'll have some bedlam buddies. Hannah is tired of the sewing room. Oh, excuse me, Hannah. I hear you are tired of the sewing room. Big guffaws from these ignorant bitches, their blotchy faces, their untouched cunts. So that was 26. And I'll finish the sequence with uh, 20, 29. Here, in the left luggage department, the time passes out the dust particles and the dust particles win. The force of inertia, the tease of tumbleweed, the interlock like a double genitive. All that possession and emptiness fills your days. You come to inhabit terms like remnant road, rubbish avenue, abyss with no bliss, 
or put another way, abyssless bliss. It's not that we are all lost. Most of us were never found. We were never lost. We were left. It's not a lost and loster department. It's a leave them to rot department. Find me. I'm Hannah Greeley and I want to go home. From Poems of Isolation by Rita Ann Higgins. Um, and it's in 31 parts. You know, you, you've read some of them and I, I would really urge people to to read all of it. It's, it's, it's a remarkable piece of work. Um, Rita Ann, over, over, the, over the decades you've written a number of, of hard enough political poems, um, not shying away from issues in and of Northern Ireland. I wonder, would your natural sympathies be with republicanism and would that have been spurred by the injustice and repression that led to the civil rights campaign and all that followed from the crushing of that? And I suppose we were all witnesses to what happened. Uh, funnily enough, I, I'm late to everything, kind of. But my first memories of any sign of politis being, becoming politicised was after the funeral of Bobby Sands. Uh, my mother died in, in 1971 and I remember her saying, just like, it might have been a year, it might have been 69, I remember her s praying that, that something was happening in the North. And I was very young that time and she was really upset about it. Now she wasn't a political person. She was a really, really fine person, but she wasn't at all political, but she was devastated by something that was happening. So that really moved to me. And then after that hearing about Poppy Sands, and then I one time I saw uh, Bernadette Devlin up in uh, Bohemoor. She went in to use Mrs. Cleary's toilet. I remember that vividly. And I was still young and I thought, my goodness, what is she talking about? Is this really, is this for real? And th so that was kind of like, a, uh, uh, this gets you outside your own village. For a lot of the time, we're all insular. And we, you know, you do this, you watch your, your, your soap operas, you do this, you buy jumpers and whatever. And then little things happen and you say, whoa. And then, so, so that was Bernadette Devlin. And then um, I knew Mrs. Farrell, Murad Farrell's mother. I, I knew her son. He lived in one of the he lived in one of the avenues in Merview, and all the avenues were called after the 1916 leaders, as it happens. And so I, I knew them. And uh, when when she died, um, they were just like they responded like any. They didn't respond in a different way to anyone else who had a tragedy. And, you know, uh, I be, had heard a lot about her from her brother and I just, so that's how I came at it. And even though I don't think that was the best, you know, I wouldn't like ever say what was the best poem or anything, but looking back on it, uh, you know, I could have made that better. Mm. I could have worked on that because you do that all the time when you look at your poems, you say, oh, darn, I take out that line. I should have made that tighter. And so, so that was how, and then, I, through Salmon, I, Salmon Publishing, who publishes me and I'm published by Blood X in the UK, um, Jessie said many, many, many years ago, I think it was 1988, she said, there's a letter here from some, some prisoners in Long Cash and they, they're doing a workshop and they want to, and she said, I'm sending this to you and see, will you do anything with this? So I replied to the letter. And I, the, I was writing then to Lawrence McKeown, who was a former hunger striker. And at one time, yeah. I went to visit him in Longcash, and that's how the poem, the H Block Shuttle, came about. So that's so like I wouldn't say I'm a rabid Republican in any sense of the word, and I absolutely hated proxy bombs. And when I'd hear things like that, but these were the people who I met along the way, and I, I, you know, I thought these are just real people as well. You make this human reaction to yeah, them. Yeah, and, and these things have happened in their lives that made them do that, that they wanted to do that because of this. I have to listen, I have to learn. It doesn't mean that I have to get an AK-47 or whatever, you know. Yeah. So. You can, yeah, but you can make poems. And something I, I was delighted with, Rita, uh, earlier 
this year you received the Living Poets Society Award uh, and uh, I think you also represented Ireland at an international poetry, liter literary po and poetic kind of online gathering uh, organised by the Greek government. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was... and do, do those kinds of recognitions help keep the heart up and the, and the pen flowing? I'll tell you something that happened yesterday. My Christy and my husband and my, my second eldest girl, Jennifer, and her three little fellas were in the Ballyband Library. And uh, she, uh, the Jackson, Stonewall, little grazer, and he came over to Christy and he said, your wife is over there. <laughs> and they had this, all my books out and the uh, pictures. Well, you know, that meant more to me than anything. I, I, Jennifer sent me the pictures and it was a hoot. And getting that award uh, down in um, the County Leash a few, uh, last month, that was lovely because it was, it was, a, I was given bog oak, an inkwell made from bog oak and uh, something else as well. Uh, I can't think of the, the, the other wood. And just what the people got up and read my poems to yes. me. Okay. And I thought, my goodness, thank you so much. And that, that, they were nice treats. Now, you know, there was no purse attached to them, but the purse is coming, Vincent. <laughs> The inkwell is the inkwell is the main thing. Keep, <laughs> keep the keep the ink flowing. Um, can we finish with that with with uh, a poem I love from from uh, Pathogen's Love and Patsy, oh, and yeah. uh, one that gave me a great laugh. It's a, I must wash down the banister. All oh, right, so uh, that would have been one of the stars. Yeah, yeah, it was one of the uh, first ones. That's, right? so it's page twelve. Page it 12, it, yeah, it made me laugh a lot. Okay. I must wash down the banister. I keep getting a reminder on my phone that I'm running out of road. Your eye cloud is bursting, lady. Do something. Will I get the extra storage base or will I delete things? Say if I delete videos of the kids and regret it. I regret it already. It's probably those audio books, but I can't bear to delete them. But you've listened to them all. What difference does that make? Will my grandson be okay? the only child one. At least the other three have each other. Will the only grandson be on his phone the whole time? Will he miss his school friend so much it will damage him? I don't want to pay the extra two ninety nine a month. It's wrecking my head. They are trying to catch me. It was 99 cents first. Next it will be five euro. How do I log on to the iCloud? I'll ring him. Kids know all this stuff. He did. Are there 14 days up yet? Can we get up to see the ballet band three? Is the 14 days from day one or 14 days from the day I rang the doctor? Will I wash the kitchen floor? I must finish that book. I should wash the kitchen floor. I should wash my hands again. I should freeze much more stuff. Oh God, we have no Lemsep. Is he spending too much time in his room? Is he lonely without his friends? He says, I'm fine. We have loads of Upper Walia and we have interactive games. Would you like to try writing a poem? No, thanks, Mamo. You're grand. I'm on a game with my friends. Talk soon. Bye. Himself is downstairs. I can hear him talking. Did I hear you on WhatsApp to the boys? We, why didn't you call me? I was just upstairs. Were they okay? Does JJ look tired? She doesn't sleep well, you know. Is the 14 days, is it 14 days yet? Did I hear you coughing a while ago? Don't be going out the back without your jacket. We watch the news. You don't know how I can watch four news channels at the same time. I don't know either. I can't stop. Can we go for a walk? What's two metres in yards? Where will we go? Not the prom. Not the beach, there will be too many there. We may as well stay in and watch Netflix or the news. How many cases today? It seems a lot. I think it's in the air. I must wash down the banister. I know I've never done it before, but something is telling me to do it now. <laughs> Rita Higgins, thanks so much. You're very welcome. Mila Falchroth. This is the beginning of my current novel that I'm working on, uh, The Marauders, and this is uh, 
a true account, if you like. There's a fragment of a letter from Patrick Farrell to my father, Brendan McNamee, in May 1983. Cork Prison Censored. Patrick Farrell, Cork Prison, Rathmore, Rathmore Road, 10 NLG 1983, 2 NLG 1983. Dear Brendan, how are things out there? I just thought I'd drop you a few lines as it's Sunday here and we have plenty of time on our hands. Well, first of all, I want to thank Sweeney for coming up. Tell Larry also, he can drop me a line if there's any queries regarding anything. You need not show him this letter. I wonder how they got on with that business that I'd arranged with your wee man. Any word from him? Did he come to see you? What do you think of this business, Brendan, that I'm supposed to be involved in? I think it might be a good idea to try and get proof of where he was between those dates that were mentioned. What do you think of that barrister? I suppose he'd be good enough for the trial. I meant to, to have a chat with you the last end of letter fragment. The letter is the only hard evidence of these things that had indeed happened, and they happened in the way I described them. Some stories seem to tell themselves, and other stories seem to wish to remain untold. It is uncertain which this is. Owen McNamee, um, extracts here from a new novel you're working on, and, and one that chimes very much with, I suppose, our general focus on, on borders uh, at this year's Iron Mountain Literature Festival. A deeply personal story as well. Tell me a little bit about it. I suppose it's a, it's a working through the hinterland of, of fathers. Um, the book came about, um, my father was a prominent solicitor, uh, very well known. Let's say kind of flew too high, got too close to the sun and ended up essentially in many ways a ruined man. Um, but one of the things he did after he'd been made bankrupt um, in the High Court in Belfast was he set up the first Bureau of Challenge on the border. And, you know, it was to change the currency from to punts in the south. Uh, it was an incredible business. Uh, at some stages, we, because the only people you could really trust for your family, we, we would work in it, and um, I'd be standing up to my waist in money sometimes in cash. Um, but it also was a magnet for corruption, and it was a, a dark lens through which to see the border. And uh, we were surrounded by, in many ways, criminality, violence, um, uh, on a level which I suppose when you talk about the, the border and you try and describe it in political terms, this is uh, this was a border in psychic terms. A line from the opening there, your own words after the letter from Patrick Farrell to your father, you say, some stories seem to tell themselves and other stories seem to wish to remain untold. It is uncertain which this is. Why did you feel compelled to tell the story? There is, I mean, when I look at it now, there's, uh, there's astonishing material in there. And why would you not tell this story? Um, uh, there's a lot of, I, th I think because a lot of it is quite bizarre and quite strange. And it follows the kind of the, the architecture of real stories can somehow sometimes seem improbable. And I think it took me to this stage in my life where I could look at it. And where it started was it was <laughs> almost kind of the opposite to, to, if you like, the poetic intentions of the book. I was having coffee with a Netflix producer that I was doing some work with, and we started talking about this. I started telling this, uh, telling her this story, and she went, um, "You know, that's the Sopranos." And I said, "Well, yes, but the Sopranos is made up, you know, and, and, and this wasn't." So, yeah, this is real. Um, do you think your father would would want the story told? Do you think he'd mind that it's told? How does one ever know? How does well, one ever well, know? Yeah, well, whether, whether he mind, mind, minds, or certainly mind, he's been dead for a long time, but uh, whether he minds or not, I mean, my brother did turn around to me at one stage and say, leave your father alone, he's been dead a long time. Um, but I, because I suppose it's a, he's a conduit into what happened over the kind of 30 years of my uh, growing up in the, in the north and, and on the border because we moved classic uh, northern situation, if you like, and it almost kind of encapsulates a lot of what went on. Mm -hmm. We had to move across the border because uh, from Kilkeel, which is sort of Bible Belt fishing town, um, to Ravensdale, which is more or less on the border, uh, on the southern side, because of uh, money involved in the hotel that he owned, which had been blown up and he hadn't repaid, and he kind of fled across the border, and fled it really, kind of in, in, in with, a, with a month's notice. Um, so. Yeah, um, I, I, I can't really tell the story without that kind of conduit of, of, of the father into it. Um, and it's not as if, you know, I'm not 
working out any kind of psychological issues to myself or whatever. It's just that there was this van and there was this story. Oh, and an extract that you, you sent me, um, powerful extract from, the, from this work, a, a tough read. Um, details from uh, murder-suicide of Paddy Farrell and his girlfriend Lorraine in Drogheda in uh, 1997. All the indications are that she shot him and then herself, as was a re reversal of the general pattern of tragedies like that. What more do we know of, of them and that story and how does it fit into the n terrain of this, this new work? Well, it's, it's, it's a factual, like um, Patrick Farrell, Paddy Farrell and, and my father who had various business dealings to, uh, um, together, uh, very, very murky uh, business dealings. Um, uh, Paddy was a career criminal, um, very charming man. Um, I was a law student in uh, Trinity and I walked into this bureau of Shaw Engineering one day and Paddy was there. I was on my way back to Dublin Sunday evening and my father said, Paddy will give you a lift. So Paddy gave me a lift and we went down all the side roads and across the border that way. And he used three different IDs. We got stopped three times, police, army and guards. And uh, he used a different ID in a different name every time. And the two of us, I remember we ended up driving down the quay in Dublin past the four courts and the two of us were laughing and said, in a couple of years time, you're going to be the guy with the wig and uh, the prosecutor and I'd be in the dock, the defendant. Um, and you know, I mean, and if if there's a movie reference, it's it's good for us because there's something that they got right in that, which is um, these very charming people. But when it comes to business, the the demeanour changes. Yeah. It's business. Um, but yeah, and then after that, Paddy was shot dead by his 29 year old girlfriend, who then turned the gun on himself. He was naked on the bed with a mask over his eyes, apparently, um, and. Uh, in some kind of sex game, I suppose, and, and uh, she took out a shotgun. And yeah, but again, the, the, the further you look at all those happenings, the, the more you look into them, the, the, le the less you see, I think. And maybe, in a way, the less we can understand. It's, it's, it's that though you talk about the, that murkiness, and in a way, it's, it's, it makes it so hard to see past the murk. Yeah, yeah. And you know, if, if there's a, a voice that emerged from my writing of this, it's, it's, it's Lorraine Farrell's voice. Um, there were no relations, just happened to share a surname. But, uh, and then there's a, is there a moral dimension to that, that I'm, I'm putting words into her mouth, you know, uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it, it's a difficult terrain I put myself into, and, and, I, and I feel that if you are to make art or to write about um, the North, I suppose, uh, those are the places you have to go. On oh, the, the pathology of, of, of violence, uh, you know, out of, I suppose, the horror of the so-called troubles is something you've dealt with in many books before. Um, and, you know, we see plenty of evidence of it around here, the kidnap of and torture of Kevin Lunny of Quinn Industrial Holdings two years ago. I suppose a terrible reminder of, of what's under the skin of things. Um, and that seems to be the part of the terrain you, you're exploring, you know, what, what, the, what the border, in a sense, almost allowed and perhaps to an extent still allows. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I referred to it uh, in a piece that I did about the border when, when the thing was very fraught uh, with Brexit as a, as a line of malice. And um, I think borders, um, by, by definition, attract uh, malice to them. And you only have to look at, you know, Hungary's razor wire, you know, Trump's wall in the desert, um, you know, uh, people have driven back to Haiti with, with bull whips um, to see what borders do. And uh, yeah, I mean, I always feel when, when I talk about these things in, in, in political terms that there are people who talk about it much better in political terms are able to, to explain them. Um, I just try and find the, the, the images, if you like, try and find the imagery there. The actuality of it, the, the, the facts, and also again where, where where the humanity meets the political and and becomes twisted and thwarted in the, in the in in the process. And again, it's something we've talked about before. How in, often what happens in real life uh, can seem much more extreme or even surreal and almost unbelievable than what we might invent in fiction. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's hard to apply three act structure to some of these things because that's not the way they happened. Um, it's hard to apply, uh, uh, I feel like, uh, internal logic to 
how a lot of these things came came about, a lot of these kind of border incidents, uh, border incursions, if you like, incursions into the, the soul of the place as much as anything else, um, because the the logic, well, there, is, there there is no actual logic. There, there there's a there, there's some kind of eerie shape shifting feel to 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 much of it. Um, that's very hard to, to 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 pin down. So, I think by the telling of it and by seeing it through this lens, if you like, of, of this book, um, it brings it to a different into a different space. Um, these things are not un, un, understandable by economics or politics or sociology alone. Um, you know, it, 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 I remember um, somebody saying a few years ago about this book, The Ultras, which again was a border book, it was based around uh, Robert Nyrak and also about the secret war in the North. And um, Morris Hayes, Senator Morris Hayes said to me, um, he said, the only way we'll get to any truth of these matters is through art. In reference in the, the Ultras in, in, in particular, I thought, well, that's letting everybody off the hook. You know, that's, and, and he was a senior civil servant and was only senior Catholic civil servant. Um, I knew him because he was interested in down football and I met him at a football match. Um, but, uh, and, but then I realised afterwards that he knew how the systems worked. He knew how they buried things. He knew how they made things disappear. He knew how they dragged things out. And he, he was right. He was correct. So we sometimes need, in a way, the, the, the spade of art to dig and, and yeah. throw things up. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But, and it, but as, as the only way to, to, to reach into this and, 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 and uncover some kind of, if truth is the right word, I don't know. Would you read a little more from sure, yeah. the manuscript of the um, new book? This is the, the, the Bureau de Change, which my father set up, the first bureau that set up the border. Um, okay. Yeah, I wonder why it took so long to, to write about this place. Um, uh, the Bureau of Challenge was a rented shop front of Water Street in Newry belonged to Brendan. There was a gangland feel to it. The front of it was fake wood with a teller's window in the middle. The window was bulletproof glass set into a heavy steel frame. The perspex abraded and hard to see through. The dual carriageway in front of it carried the majority of cross-border traffic going from Belfast into the border hinterlands and beyond to Dublin. The other buildings on the street were what remained of the old town when the roadmen pushed through and flats built on the cleared ground. There was a shoe shop, a paint and wallpaper shop, a barber's. The owners emigrated from some place within far count countries of the watchful heart. They'd sit at their doorways, roomed and frail. The only ground they stood on was that of their own imagining, and a bureau took its own place among them. A yellow sign said money changed. There was no statement of ownership or any other welcome. From the start, this is about one thing. It was about money, the getting of it, the love of it, the spending of it. If money had a God, Jean said, then this place would be its church, its grimy roadside chapel, godless. There was smuggling money being made on the border. Criminal operations were run on both sides, which made them harder to police. If you were caught, you could change jurisdictions, use different addresses, different identities. Men roamed the loveless ground of the frontier. They were actors in bad faith who possessed of none at all. Bodies and informers were left in roadside verges wrapped in bin bags. These were the lawless times and these were the currencies of the night. The board was not the backdrop against which morality was acted out. It was instead the abyss into which it emptied. Owen, uh, you'll be giving the John McGachran Memorial Lecture for us uh, next month in late November with, and we'll announce the precise date and, and venue for that before long. Uh, and we hope there will be a public audience um, and be very pleased that, that people would have the opportunity to hear you in person. As a McGaffin's mapping of, of this territory and I suppose of the borders of, of human desire and, and experience really endures, doesn't it? You know, and I suppose like the, the best art, including yours, becomes universal, you know, no matter how much it's rooted in a, in a particular place. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 when I was first asked about this, the, the, um, that I mean, face the rising sun came into my mind, and there's an encounter in that book with um, I, I think I know the the, the, the Republican who who, who, who referenced reference in it, um, or I know who he is, and um, it struck me, and I, I I'm I'm just not sure of of John McGarren's intentions in it, if you like, but the conversation is interesting because um, if you like the school teacher figure, um, almost forgives the Republican for what uh, what Republicans have done. And it brought me back to, I mean, a phrase I've, I've, I've in many ways applied more to unionism than, uh, than if you like, uh, nationalism stroke republicanism. Uh, it was the Confederate, or the, the, the Southern officer who said to Lincoln, um, uh, shortly before Lincoln was assassinated, um, you will forgive us 
uh, but we will not be forgiven for we hate you. And I think I think that's where the phrase the unforgiven comes from. But uh, that there, there, you know, when, you, when the teacher was speaking to this Republican figure, um, as we, where, how do you assume that you have the power to forgive me or to, to strive for yes. me for, yes. for something which I do not think is a wrong anyway? You know? yes. John always had this you know, ability to draw the North towards us. I mean, that it, it, it's so close anyway, you know, for man and his skin, that, that yeah. Blake's power, all of that is, is, you know, nestles around his work. And there's always this feeling of the eye looking and this, 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 this magnet of connection in it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, for me, moving from the side of the border that I was on the, on the, on the East Coast, if you like, mm. Uh, and coming from a town which, I mean, it's, it's a lazy enough description, but it is Bible Belt, and you know, it, it, it's, it's yes. a, I mean, a small town who lost eleven young men in the, in the security forces, higher proportion per head apparently than almost anywhere else in, in, in the north. To this border, yeah. uh, and and further west, if you like, towards the, um, uh, into Fermanagh, um, that there is a. Honest wage bitterness there, which you do not taste where I come from. It just strikes me as much more visceral and 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 fundamental. Um, and uh, John got it. Eugene McCabe, of course, was cancer and and all yes. of those stories. I, I, I understood it very very well. And there is that intrinsic understanding, I think, in 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 John McGarden, which is not. It doesn't refer to the wider framework of what we now refer to as the Troubles, or whatever, mm. you, whatever you want to call it. It's that, it's the war that's um, engaged in, in people's hearts, I think, and in, 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 in that territory of, of, of the soul. And then it, it, he manages, of course, to, you know, as all uh, great writers do, uh, keep, keep, it, keep it local but make it universal. You know, I, I think um, your writing, your, your work on, on this new novel will inform some of the themes around the McGarren lecture, you know, the, the 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 border, the Irish border, as a kind of fault line for darkness and occasional light of different kinds too, you know. And uh, I suppose a, a a line around which, as you've said, you know, criminality and corruption did build and sustain. And you know, John wrote about the power of darkness um, and. The border, you know, it strikes me that the border sometimes seems almost to have pulled that power in around it. Um, and if we look at a series of of stories of linked almost vignettes around around border life, you might get flashes of that. Yeah, well, I mean, there is a, you know, there is a particular, <laughs> to Brexit time, you know, they were doing a piece about the borders, they were doing a TV piece, and be a man looking over a gate and cows in the distance, um, you know, but that was not what the border was. I mean, I remember driving with my, my brother up to the Flat Lake Festival shortly after everything, the border infrastructure, military infrastructure had been dismantled, mm. and we had gone to school across the border, we'd, you know, smuggled, we'd, we'd High-speed high pursuits at some, some stage, just get it. All the and, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah um, but uh, and and we looked at each other, and it was a kind of a, kind of a cliche thing. We said, but um, but did we dream all of that? Mm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and it, fe it it felt dreamed. You know, yes. it, it felt you know a, a, a landscape of something other. And and I mean, what drifted into my head was you know uh, Berlin. You know. Mm. You know who who said that one tree in Berlin is more sinister than a whole forest in Vienna. Um, it had that, uh, if you like, deep warming effect. But it wasn't. A, there was almost a, it, it seems to be a kind of uh, a, an attempt to show it as this sort of quite straightforward um, rural, uh, you know, sort of upswelling of of of, of bitterness and, um, and 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 division. But to me, it always worked on a much deeper level than that, and it was a it it was a modern border. It was a twentieth century border, now a twenty first century border. It, it it didn't have its roots in past conflict. It has roots. You could find the roots in Berlin. You could find its roots in South America. You could find, you know, and all, you you can find its roots in a rabbit proof, proof fence. You know, those those are those are the context of it. The difference between, uh, I suppose, 
the truth and uh, historical fact uh, is something you, you've addressed before. Um, uh, you know, the historical record showing one thing, the truth maybe being something very different. And I suppose there's a border in that too, you know, this border between the official record and what the artist will draw on to make their work. You know, that search for truth maybe, um, or at least something that will unsettle and kind of unbend the line that sometimes passes for truth. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if you purport to provide an answer, uh, you know, uh, mm. I, I think you're by necessity wrong. I mean, there were, I mean, whatever happens with the border, there will be imperfect solutions, of course. But, uh, but um, uh, to be kind of glib about it, I mean, it, it, it's how you you, you you ask the question, really, that, 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 that that's important, I think. Uh, and what effect that has, I mean, I'm not really sure, kind of, um, I mean, I, I kind of realize at this stage that I don't really write too far at anyone, but uh, mm. so, but I mean, simply that these stories have to be, have to be followed, yeah. and there's an element of of, of necessity of imperative. And to me, you know, the story finds you around you finding the story, and that moment sitting having coffee with the mm. the, the Netflix producer, uh, which is so far away from from all of this. Yeah. I kind of realize, well, actually, there's, yeah, not that not that she was right with the analogy, but. Um, I can I can tell the star at least I can make an attempt at telling it. Do you have a little more from the yeah. from the book? To be. She could see them in pursuit across, across open country, wanted. Every hand turned against him, every door barred against him apart from the few who were willing to take a risk, their outlaw allure. She took Paddy's arm, put her head on his shoulder. If he looked down, he would see her face softened in the dashboard lights, bound to him in backlit fidelities. The radio talking about events along the border, road closures, hijacked cars, driving past the filling stations and bureau shawns on the northern side, everything bootleg and tawdry. They're putting industrial alcohol in Smurlof bottles and selling it round the pubs. They're cooking the trace dye out of diesel oil, bringing it across the border in tankers. Nobody is saying that the customs are paid off, but they are. This is the most highly surveilled area of Europe. There are military watchtowers, continuous helicopter overflights, links are from Bessbrook Airbase, Air Base, the drop zones. You don't land, you hover and foot patrols fall to the ground. And they're seen, if they're seen at all, as grainy, running shapes. These are the invoked phantoms of the drop zone. Eamon can drive a 40-ton rigid tanker of Dr. Diesel oil along the border and make it disappear. There are shells which straddle the borderline, and who's to say that the truck you drive into one end is a truck that you drive out the other end? This is strange terrain, unsolid, ghosted true. Something you said before on, it has struck me as being apt to all of this. You know, you, you said that, um, and if you, I suppose the thing is, you're looking at people and the way they behaved within the boundaries that they knew, the boundaries of, of their time. Um, you do have that particular framework. So, you know, it strikes that like for, there's a generation now who don't know any of this really. You know, it's like another world to them. Um, and uh, yet you lived in that world, I lived in it. Uh, we crossed that border when it was a, you know, a, a military border, effectively, um, and lived through so much of that, of the horror of it. Um, but uh, you, you, in making a work like this new novel, you, you have to work within the framework of, of what was. There's nothing else to do. I mean, and, and you're making a picture that then comes down through time, and whether it whether it ever becomes, uh, a, you know, Netflix or movie or not, it's it's it, there's a it, there's a great sense of the visual and what you do anyway. But it it it's a marker on time too. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose what you're trying to do is find the linguistic textures of 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 this time and apply it to to this, so that it doesn't read like history. Mm -hmm. You know, find that if you like that kind of. And what I'm trying to, I'm trying to write it quite fast in a way, uh, which is, is not my natural way at all, to get that, to try and imbue a little bit of that urgency into it. And, you know, to get that in the last piece that I read, there, I don't sort of, you know, filmic, almost using kind of film terminology and, and, and trying to get those, um, if you like, scene references into it. Uh, to, to, I mean, I don't know what anybody uh, who was born in the past, you know, thirty or forty years, it, 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 you know, or twenty years, is going to make of, of this, or should they make anything of it? Um, I mean, 
when you were speaking there, just a, a, a memory came into my head of my wife was the same place as I am, and we have shared a lot of these experiences. Uh, and um, our children said to us uh, um, when we were small that we don't like you and mum talking about the North. And um, we said, why? He said, um, you sound angry. You know, I said, no, we don't. Said, oh, yes, you do. You know? It's interesting because just watching um, Patrick Keelty's documentary recently about you know going back to the north and to the village where his father was murdered, and he talked to Jean McConville's granddaughter, and this is whole thing of transgenerational trauma, you know, and, and uh, it's what young people inherit and 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 have to carry. But um, in a way, the writer, the artist's responsibility is something else. I mean, you 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 deal with what. What's there, and you you can't you can't offer it as some solution. You know, it's it's a it's a slice of of life and art. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I picked up um, a book I haven't read since we were youngsters. Uh, Mary Reynolds, a Persian boy, um, which, yeah, which is about Alexander the Great and his uh, his catabite, if you like, um, um, uh, and the sense of blood. And vengeance and the authority of blood running through Greek drama. I realised that that's why I was reading it because yes. it, it, it it resonates with this, mm. which I hope is is if you like the the, the universal part of it, yeah. and uh, the cruelty and yes, the shedding of blood and pain and dismantling of family and structure as law. Um, you know which which is. I suppose it brings me back to you know, my father having been a lawyer, but um, but I, I realised that something drew me to that book. Yeah. Well, we we might finish with with another extract from from this novel in progress. Uh, uh, we'll announce the details of of uh, the John McGarry Memorial Lecture on McNamee's John McGarry Memorial Lecture in the next few weeks. It it will be. Uh, next month in, in November and uh, Owen, it's so good to talk to you and uh, yeah, as I said, you know, some of this hard read, um, but yeah, we need it as well. Okay, well this was just a, a, a piece from later on in the book where I planned to, to put it down. There is this was driving home one night across the border with my father and uh, there is a kind of a plaza in the middle of the road, anyone knows that road and, and you, you wouldn't have known what was there, but it actually what was this old customs post, which was a, a modernist building, a winged modernist building, like the Caboussier Caburs building, beautiful building. Uh, and they blew it up seven times before they got it, um, and because the structure was so open that it just blew the glass out. But on this place, as we drove home, I mean, it was maybe one o'clock in the morning, lorries were sitting around on fire, or tickets at lorries, maybe six, seven of them. Uh, uh, some of them had burned completely out, some of them were still in flames, a smell, heavy, rank smell of, of diesel oil in, in, in the air. And we were inching between them in this Toyota Corolla, um, not knowing when you inch past one into the shadow beyond it, what was waiting there for you. And we just drove through. We never mentioned it to each other again. Never. We didn't, we didn't even talk about it on the way home. Um, uh, the spaces between the lorries looked black, geometric, deliberated over. Brendan moved the car slowly forward. Whatever had taken place here was over, but the next thing might happen. The smells of spilled fuel, heated metal, tar melt. To either side of us, the unpeopled dark, the undrained fenlands, the burning trucks flare. The expectation was abstract. There was an end place. In the morning, there would be the burned out frames. Owen, quiet in the passenger seat, you could feel the heat through the glass of the passenger window. What does it mean? His father's face lit by fire in the night. Decades later, someone asked the question, do you realise how many pe people around your father died violent deaths? He said then that those were just the times, but he knew there was not just the times. What he couldn't say was where all this death came from. If one father brought it in his wake, did all fathers dwell in blood and flame?